All right. So welcome to week two. We're going to talk about early Virginia, and this is going to be how the British come to North America and how the British get involved with colonies in North America. And the very, very first colony is the Roanoke Colony. And a lot of people think it's Roanoke, Virginia, but really Roanoke Island is off the coast of North Carolina. This is going to happen in the year 1584. Um, Britain is really going to be one of the last to come over and colonize. And it's kind of a condition of everybody else is doing it, so why don't we? And in 1584, a fairly wealthy British guy named Sir Walter Raleigh is going to go to the Queen, who at the time was Queen Elizabeth I, and come up with this proposal to come over to the New World set up a colony, and send back whatever he finds. Queen Elizabeth I is going to agree to this, and Walter Raleigh is going to come over in, I think it's 1582 or 1583, and scout out the area and find a good place to land and set up his colony. He's going to leave a couple of people behind to start working on the colony, and Walter Raleigh is going to go back himself and get about 120 settlers together, put them on a boat, and those 120 or so people are going to sail back to Roanoke Island, and they're going to set up there. Now, what happens is when these 120 or so settlers get back to Roanoke, they find that the people that were originally left behind, they're not there. Nobody knows what happened to them. Um, it's kind of a bad start to this colony, but... By this point in time, they're already across the ocean. They can't really go back, and they're going to just make the best out of it they can. So it's 117 settlers officially. They're led by a guy named John White, and they're going to settle. They're going to start building a little town on this island. And about a month after, John White is going to leave to go back to Britain. And that's simply because he's supposed to go back and get supplies, and he's supposed to go back and get another shipment of people. The problem, though, is while John White is in England getting things ready, a war breaks out between Spain and Britain, or England at that time. And the Queen is going to use pretty much every ship available to stop the Spanish, and it's not until after the war is over that John White is able to get a ship and sail back to North America. Well, when he gets back to his Roanoke colony that he's supposed to be running, it's completely abandoned. The houses are torn down. There's a couple of cannon. Uh, there are a couple of treasure chests that are open, but none of the treasure is missing. Uh, and there's a fence that's around the perimeter. So they disappeared but there are a few things left over on a tree and also on one of the fence posts is the word croatoan and that's really the only key that we have to these people now there is a group of people who are further south who are known as the croatan uh, native american group or indigenous group and there's a theory that the people may have moved south to live with the Croatans. And that's because the Croatans were friendly to the English settlers. But there's also theories that they moved further inland. There's also a theory that they were just killed. But as far as what happened to the Roanoke colony, we may never know, although archaeology is getting us closer and closer, closer to the correct answer. So, Roanoke Colony is the first attempt by the English. It's a failed attempt, but that does not stop them. Now, I'm going to skip this video. It's a video you can watch on your own at home. Uh, so, let's go to slide number four. This is the Jamestown Colony. This is going to be attempt number two by the English. And by 1605, we do have a different monarch in England. Queen Elizabeth has died and her cousin, King James of Scotland, is now going to be King James of England and Scotland. And King James, he hasn't given up on the idea of settling in North America. 
So he's going to put together what's known as a joint stock company. Uh, in other words, the king is going to put together this company. He's going to ask for investors, and he's going to say, okay, whatever we find, whatever money we get, uh, we'll split evenly. King James has told the investors that we'll find gold, we'll find olives, we'll find a way to get to China, we'll make a lot of money, and so people just start throwing money at the king. By 1607, three ships are put together with 100 men, and all 100 men on this ship, or on these ships, I should say, are considered gentlemen, meaning that they don't work, they're not commoners, they're, they're wealthy, and they come to North America, they sail up what becomes known as the James River, they settle about 40 miles upriver in a place they call Jamestown, and yes, all of that is named after the king. And what do they build? They build a fort because you got to be able to protect yourself. Uh, they build huts because you got to have a place to live. They build a storehouse because they're expecting to bring in so much money they don't know what to do with it. And then they made up a church because, well, religion. And the theory or the, the saying was they're there to uh, earn a profit. They're not there to farm. And that's going to cause a problem because there's no food being grown. People start to starve. And... Things don't get off to a very good start here in Jamestown. Well, that's where John Smith comes in. John Smith is going to be the leader of the Jamestown colony. And John Smith and a local Native American by the name of Powhatan are going to become friends. Uh, Powhatan is looking for protection from some of his enemies. John Smith is looking for somebody who will take care of him. And... It's a match made in heaven. Both sides can get something out of the other. Um, John Smith, he's also going to make it a rule that if you don't work, you don't eat. Basically, no work, no food. And when they start to run out of supplies, John Smith is going to go to Powhatan, and Powhatan is going to trade with John Smith. Uh, basically, John Smith is going to give Powhatan and his Native Americans some guns, and Powhatan is going to give John Smith food. And for a little while, it looks like everything's going to be okay. But by 1609, um, a gun backfires. And you remember, it uses gunpowder, like black gunpowder. The black gunpowder catches on fire. The gun explodes. His face gets burned. And he is forced to return back to England in hopes of getting medical attention. And John Smith, by the way, he never comes back to the New World. Uh, he just does not make it back. And um, that's going to be a bad thing for England. It's called the Starving Time. And, you know, something that's called the Starving Time is probably not good. This is no different. Uh, once John Smith is gone, the people living in Jamestown, they revert back to that no work mindset and they quit working nobody's going to listen anymore and very quickly starvation sets in by the time 1609 ends and 1610 begins there are only 60 out of those original hundred and something men who are alive all the food is eaten they eat the the livestock they eat the poultry they eat leather and then they start to eat each other and yes there are eyewitness accounts uh, there's one eyewitness account of a of a survivor who talks about them digging up corpses from graves and eating them. And then there's another eyewitness account that says that a man had taken a native wife, meaning he had gotten married or you know, started living with uh, one of the Native Americans. And the Native American woman was pregnant. Well, the settler killed his wife and then cut the baby out of the stomach of the wife and ate it for dinner. It's absolutely disgusting, but that's what they were doing. It's not until the spring of 1610 when a new governor shows up, a guy named Thomas Gates. He's going to institute the laws of Virginia that you have to read. And um, basically, if you read the laws of Virginia that were put in by Thomas Gates in 1610, everything ended in death. If you didn't go to a church, it was death. If you uh, stole, it was death. If you, um, you know, if you took the Lord's name in vain, it was death. 
And that was because Thomas Gates had to get everything back in order and had to settle everybody down. So Virginia gets off to a really questionable start, and Virginia almost fails there in like the first couple of years. Well, the colony is going to survive, and it starts this policy in 1618 that's known as the Headright Policy. And the easiest way that I can describe this in the time I have with you guys and the attention span that we're going to have, uh, if you paid your way to Virginia, you got free land. You were given 50 acres, or in some cases, later on, you were given 100 acres. But then, for every person that you could afford to bring with you, you got their land, too. So the people who are wealthy move to Virginia and suddenly they have these huge plantations, and these huge farms. What about the people that they bring with them? They're considered indentured servants. An indentured servant is not a slave, but they are treated almost like one. Uh, whoever this person is, say I'm wealthy enough to pay for myself and two or three other people. I get the land of those two or three other people. They work for me. They're working for me until they can pay off the cost of their trip. And you sign a contract. The contract is usually three to five years, but they end up being longer than that. In some cases, they can be seven to ten. The reason that those get longer is because any work stoppage is added to the end of the contract. So if you break your arm, you're probably out of work for know, three four months. Three, four months is add to your contract. If you're a female and you have a child, you're probably out of work for six months. Well, that's six months added to the end of the contract. So this indentured servitude and this headright policy are going to do two things. Number one, it's going to create the large plantations that Virginia is known for. But number two, it's going to create this, this economic system that is almost slavery, but not. Up until 1675, about 75% of the labor force in Virginia is going to be indentured servitude. After 1675, we start to get more and more slaves from Africa brought in, and that number starts to change drastically. Um, as far as the Virginia Company goes, that joint stock company, the king takes it over in 1624, and Virginia is going to become a royal colony. The Virginia Company ceases to exist. Now, politics, um, I'm going to talk about the Chesapeake Bay colonies. This is going to be Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina. They really kind of develop in a similar way politically. And whether you're talking about Maryland, Virginia, or North Carolina, some of the wealthiest families in England are going to come over to Virginia and Maryland and northern North Carolina and start these large plantations. Um, at one point in time, it was like one out of every three presidents could trace their heritage back to these first leading families. Um, but I think that number has diluted just a little bit since then. Um, the actual government system itself, bicameral legislation. Uh, that means there are legislatures with two houses, and there's also a royal governor. The House of Burgesses is going to be elected. The Governor's Council are going to be lords that serve, in some cases, for life. Um, if you're an everyday settler, you have almost no contact with the House of Burgesses. You have no contact with the Governor's Council. You definitely have no contact with the Governor. So most of your political participation is on the local level. And I'm talking like county court. Uh, you went to court for fun. Uh, you, the court's where you had to pay your taxes. The court is where you had to report for military duty. The court is where the trials are going to be held. Very much for you, if you're an everyday citizen of these colonies, it's the county court system that matters. Uh, the Church of England is active, but by 1650, you don't have nearly as much to do with the church as you did earlier. And that's not because people are less religious, it's because the colonies are starting to expand and they just quite simply, they don't have enough ministers to have a church in every single town. So what they would do is they would have ministers with districts and each minister or each priest, whatever you want to call them, were expected to be in one town every week. 
So it might be a month or two before you go to church again just because that's when the minister comes back to town. Daily life in Chesapeake, it's lonely. The farms are very far apart. You don't get to see your neighbors very often. And really the only time you see your neighbors are when you go to church or when you go to court. Uh, for agriculture, you're growing tobacco, and there are only a couple people growing food. Uh, you're more interested in making money than you are in just making your stomach stop growling. <clears throat> there aren't very many women, and there are basically zero unmarried women. Uh, this is because there just aren't that many women, so women are in high demand. But by being in high demand, it gives women some economic power because women can hold out for the best deal and they can pick and choose who they want their husband to be. Uh, additionally, if you are widowed, you're going to be remarried quickly. Uh, there is the proper period of mourning. The women wear black and everybody's sad. But when that's over, the woman goes out and she basically tries to make another deal for a second marriage. So domestic relations and agriculture and even death are very closely related in places like Virginia. In 1676, we have something called Bacon's Rebellion. And Bacon's Rebellion is led by a guy named Nathaniel Bacon. And Bacon's Rebellion in many ways is a product of the idea of indentured servitude. After an indentured servant is finished with their contract, they're supposed to be given a little bit of money and a plot of land. Well, by 1676, so much land has been given to indentured servants who are freed that it's starting to encroach and get in the way of Native Americans. So there's a lot of friction between the settlers of Virginia and the Native Americans. Some people in the government want to be friendly towards the Native Americans. Others just want to beat them up and kick them out. And Nathaniel Bacon is going to lead a mob against the Native Americans, and he's also going to lead a mob against the Virginia governor. Uh, to make a long story short, Nathaniel Bacon is going to lead a mob of these in former indentured servitudes, and he's basically going to say, we should have rights, we should have power, we should have money and encouraged the former indentured servants to attack the government because the government was bad, according to Bacon. The governor, William Berkeley, is going to be chased out of the city of Richmond. Nathaniel Bacon and his followers, they issue something called the Declaration of the People of Virginia. But in the end, Bacon is actually going to die. He dies of dysentery, which is when you use the bathroom to the point that you dehydrate yourself and you just... He died of dehydration. And once Bacon is gone, his rebellion falls apart. Governor Berkeley is able to come back into Virginia, into Richmond, and take over the city. And all of the co-conspirators are going to be arrested and put on trial. And 23 of the co-conspirators of Nathaniel Bacon are going to be hanged for basically treason. <clears throat> so Bacon's rebellion, it doesn't work but it is significant for two reasons uh, number one it's the first time that anybody in north america has risen up against the british government and number two it's at this point that people start to shift away from the indentured servitude and begin using african slavery because enslaved africans don't have any rights they don't have any way to be to be free and they're not given anything when their their uh, call of duty ends other than more enslavement now there's another video here it's called breakfast food fights back again because this is an online class you can watch it on your own the final slide here for this is about the Carolinas uh, originally, the Carolinas were one colony called the Carolina Colony, and it's also known as a Restoration Colony. Uh, it's not world history, it's not British history, so I don't want to bore you with anything, but in the 1650s, there was no king of England. Uh, king Charles I was arrested, 
tried and accused of treason and eventually killed and this guy named Oliver Cromwell is going to take over the government of England. <clears throat> well, when Oliver Cromwell dies, uh, instead of having Oliver Cromwell's son become the new leader of England, the English Parliament begs King Charles II, or I should say Charles II, to come and be the king. Basically say, hey, sorry about killing your dad. Will you come back and be our king? This other guy is really, really bad. And King Charles is going to agree to it. And as a thank you for this, uh, King Charles is going to give eight of his friends land. And this land that is given by King Charles II becomes known as the Carolina Colony. Now, the southern part of the Carolina Colony is going to be wealthier than the northern part. Uh, the southern part of the colonies is going to be used to basically feed the British islands. And because of the southern part of, of the Carolina Colony's connection with the British West Indies, it becomes a hub for the slave trade and the sugar trade and everything else. And that's actually how the city of Charlestown, now known as Charleston, becomes such an important city in the British colonies. As far as Northern Carolina, um, it's wooded and it's hilly and it doesn't really support a large, um, I don't want to put it, large plantations just don't happen in Northern Carolina. So the two parts of this Carolina colony start to change and they grow further and further and further apart. And by 1712, the Carolina colony is going to be split into North and South Carolina. So that's where the Carolina colonies come from. So, all right, that's it for this video. I'll have the second video up for you here shortly. And uh, thanks for watching.